of six children. My oldest is a freshman in college. My youngest is in second grade, so that's kind of a big gap there. Um, I, I'm not anywhere near out of this phase of life, even though I'd like to be sooner than later. Um, but I teach theology. I attempt to teach Latin, and I help coach softball and football at Wisconsin Luther. So today, we are going to be looking at maybe a familiar account to many of us, that feeding of the 5,000. And one of the bigger things is, like, what can we take away from this account? What is Jesus teaching us here through this feeding of the 5,000? Now, you've got this introduction here regarding the petition, uh, the fourth petition. My clicker's on, but it's not flipping. So there's a fourth petition um, section that you're going to see on the screen, hopefully here. There we go. I'm not going to use too many slides today, so this is fine. I don't know if I should say this, when uh, Choir Fest was at uh, Wisco this year, Choral Fest, like all these schools from around, um, there was an area of Lutheran High School not from our state that drew marker on my whiteboard. And it's not really an erasable whiteboard. And so I had my, my PowerPoints up and you could see like the drawings and things that they said on my PowerPoint. So technology can be great. Anyways. You see the fourth petition there, again, I think we're fairly familiar with that petition. The question that just is getting you to think here a little bit, why do we pray this prayer uh, in this petition in, in the Lord's Prayer? How have you potentially understood it as far as why this is included? And maybe think about what do we mean or not mean when we're talking about bread or daily bread? Go ahead. It provides it every week we need for a bodily illness. Yep. So we're not talking about like bread literally, right? Like it's included, but it's not like we're asking, Lord, I need this bread today for my physical well being. Sure, we can pray in that in that way and ask, right? But this petition is looking more at everything God gives us, everything that we need for body and life, right? Maybe another question to ponder is who does God provide this to? Who does he give this daily bread to? And it's probably an obvious answer, but I, there's something I think within that answer that is good for us to keep in mind as well. The obvious answer to who God gives daily bread to is everyone, right? But if you just break that down a little bit, who is included in everyone, right? It's, it's not just good people, not just his followers or believers, right? But it's even like the evil and the wicked, right? So God is showing people his love, his grace, and his mercy, whether they believe in him or whether they don't. You have another verse in scripture that says that God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, right? So I think that is what's going to make hell such an awful place, right? Because right now, God is showering and showing his love to people, whether they believe in him or they don't. But hell is a place where God's love lo no longer exists. It's the most painful existence anyone could possibly ever experience in his or her life, right? So people are seeing and experiencing God's love, again, whether they believe in him or don't. But especially for those who believe in God, then what is our response to that? How do we respond to God providing for, for us each and every day? Again, the answer might be obvious, but I just want us to get our thoughts flowing here. We thank and praise him, right? 
Now maybe the question is how often do we actually do that, right? Like how often don't we assume like I'm gonna have food in my fridge or I'm gonna have this or that? Like I, I talk to my students all the time, like we have all these choices, like my closet is full of clothes. And yet how often don't I stand in my closet and be like, I don't know what to wear today. Because it's not, it's not that I don't have a, like options, I, I have too many options. And I still have stuff in there that doesn't fit that I should probably get rid of, right? Not that anybody else can relate to that, okay? But we take those things for granted. I think we might get to that point a little bit when we you know, talk about how God provided in the um, feeding of the 5,000. And so I, th I think we might touch on that a little bit more coming up as well. So the biggest thing we want to look at is, again, how we respond, right? Giving thanks, praising him, all of those things. Like That'll hopefully be the biggest takeaway or point that we're going to see as we go through uh, this, again, familiar. John chapter 6. So we're just going to set kind of the, the context here, looking at John chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Um, a lot of this, my pastor Hebner wrote this and gave it to me and uh, said this is how he would have talked about context. So he just put a lot of it on the sheet for you, all right? Because he wanted me to know his thoughts. So that's, that's where we're going. But let's just begin by reading John chapter 6, all right? And we'll look at those first four verses. Maybe one thing to note here as we look through this, um, some phrases that you can just kind of gloss over, they're not necessarily, you know, just <laughs> gloss over phrases, okay? So anybody willing to read John 6, 1 to 4? Go ahead, thank you. So you see there a phrase in verse one, sometime after this, all right? So some context as far as uh, these verses go. Uh, the Apostle John is recording Jesus' activities, we'd say down south in Jerusalem, all right? Until Holy Week, the other gospel writers don't have a whole lot on these activities. Uh, they record what John does not, which would be the many activities of Jesus' second full year in the ministry, mostly up north in Galilee with Capernaum as his headquarters. Um, so that second year would have been full of preaching, teaching, and healings. So again, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would have a lot of those things recorded. But all four gospel writers um, record or have in them the feeding of the 5,000, and you have the references there uh, in those gospels, all right? Now, as you're probably familiar, there's different details, you know, depending on which gospel writer it is. Um, some are more thorough, right? Luke, if you're familiar with Luke, he was a doctor, so he was more detailed and thorough. Mark was pretty short and to the point, okay? Uh, so that doesn't mean that they were contradictory or anything like that. They just had different um, audiences they were writing to and, and things like that. So as the second year of Jesus' ministry is winding down, Mark tells us, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he, Jesus, said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. They would have been the disciples, okay? 
So maybe just focusing on those words from Mark, they wanted to take a break, they needed a rest, a mental break, whatever you want to call it, right? That um, next point there, everybody knows vacations are important for mental and physical refreshment. I just talked about like my own life, right? I often joke, but I'm sort of serious, that I need a, a weekend from the weekend, right? Because it's just so full of activities and things like that. So we all need those things, right? But what about spiritual refreshment? So for a few moments, I want you to make a list with your table partner or partners about ideas on how you can take that spiritual refreshment. All right, so I'll say 925-ish. All right, and then you can share with each other and maybe with the group. Anybody willing to kind of share what you do or ideas that you have come up with um, to find spiritual refreshment? I, there's probably obvious ones again, right? But whatever you have, you know, kind of utilized in your life to find that spiritual refreshment, uh, please be willing, willing to share that. So anybody willing to offer their ideas? Yes. Anybody else that kind of like jot down notes during this sermon? 
but this isn't to make people feel bad who aren't, right? You, so for those of you who do that, do you find it beneficial? I'm assuming you do. Right? Do you find that it kind of makes your focus more laser-like as you're listening to the sermon? Um, I did it more in the last several years of my parish ministry. Um, I had like catechism students, for example, like do service summaries. And for the most part, like I believe they would have, they say it, it was beneficial. Because a lot of times, especially younger, and I, I would suggest it's even when people are older. Like you go to a worship service and you're not quite sure why do you do what you do? Like what's the point of this type of stuff? And you're able to explain, like, this is why you have the invocation. This is why you have confession, right? This is why you have this prayer or that prayer. This is why the sermon has these components, like law, gospel, like identify the law, identify the gospel. And I found it, that they found it beneficial, and I'm assuming you are doing it because you find that beneficial too, right? Any other ideas or ways in which you find that spiritual refreshment? Like the year time of grace type? Yeah. Sure. There's definitely content online, right? Like one of the things that maybe if you want to call it a benefit of COVID, was it forced churches to like do digital ministry, right? And for the most part, those churches have continued that on. I don't know of too many that have said, well, we're, COVID's kind of done, we're done with that. Yeah, so that's a good way. Sort of related to that, maybe this is an idea somebody had, like you can get devotion sent to your email, right? And they're like five minutes maybe. You can read them, they have audio where you could listen to them if you want, right? So there's things like that. Anybody else have any ways? Yeah. 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 That is absolutely true. I remember a seminary professor telling us uh, sometimes you just have to say no. Because in the ministry, like, you always kind of want to say yes. And there's times you just got to say no. And it's not because I don't like you or because I don't want to do what you're asking, but maybe I've got this family thing going on and I need to be there for my family. Or I'm on the verge of just being burned out and I just need to, like, I need to not do it. You know what I mean? And that's another example there, too. Do I have to ask, is there like, is there an age requirement? Or That's great. We sort of had a, something like that at my previous church. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, 
the church I came from, I, some of you might know this, the church I was before I went to Wisco, if you're driving from like Madison to Milwaukee, like right outside Lake Mills, there's a little white church, like you can reach out and touch it. I was at that church before I came to Wisco for five and a half years. Um, and they had started it a little bit before I got there. They called it beer and Bible study. <laughs> and in Lake Mills, there's a brewery called Tyranina, if you've heard of Tyranina. And so it was usually Wednesday or Thursday nights, a group of guys from the church would get together, uh, myself included, and we'd just you know, go to Tyranina, we'd have a few beers and just talk spiritual stuff. Like, what I, what I say we like had like specific Bible study, not necessarily, not all the time. There were times we did, but it was more like, like just encouraging like fellow brothers in the faith. And um, it was beneficial because one of the guys who was a regular with that, um, his wife ended up leaving him and all this kind of stuff. And like it built a relationship that I might not have had with this church member if I didn't, you know, take time to do that on those evenings. And so, um, you know, was it, again, was it specific, like, Bible study? Not all the time. But, like, we would read a devotion or, like, just talk about, you know, things at church and how do we apply God's word and all that kind of stuff. I sort of joke, but I'm not. Like, bars might be the best place for evangelism. <laughs> I remember being at a pastor's conference in the Dells, and, like, we went to a place, and um, a pastor who I highly respect had this conversation with a bar patron who may not have been fully, like, aware of things, but the conversation that he had with this individual, like, the, the person was, like, bawling their eyes out because of, like, you know, the spiritual things they were talking about. And so how many people are truly, like, hurting, you know, and searching for answers, you know, sitting, you know, on a bar stool or whatever it is? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, of course. <laughs> All right, any other ideas before we move on here? I was introduced at Christmas time to Praetorius. If you've heard of him, like that was a, one I've enjoyed. Like we, my wife especially was big into like listening to Handel's Messiah over Christmas, like the entire thing. So like she's from Minnesota and so we will drive and uh, on XM, like they have a channel, Sirius XM, where they play the entire Handel's Messiah. And the kids are like, can we listen? No, we're waiting for a hallelujah chorus. But then Worthy is the Lamb at the end is also a great one, too, if, if you're familiar with that, right? Like, are we specifically doing, like, Bible study? Not necessarily, right? But you're, you're letting stuff, you know, surround you or envelop you that has spiritual connotation, and it can help your thoughts and all those kinds of things, right? All right. So, just... For more context, in verse 4, you have that phrase that the Jewish Passover feast was near. The Apostle John here is the one who mentions the Passover and other festivals, giving us a, a potential timeline for Jesus' ministry. All right? So John 2, verse 13, it says there that when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, not long after Jesus' baptism, temptation in the wilderness, and first miracles... Thus, you have the beginning now of the third and final year of his ministry. John 5, verse 1 talks about Jesus going up to Jerusalem for a feast. Um, there were three festivals when the Israelites were to go to Jerusalem. Two were in the spring. That would have been Passover and Pentecost. Um, and Pentecost, we obviously think about like the giving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pentecost uh, would have been 
as far as I understand, just kind of like this harvest festival, like in the springtime. Uh, and then it was later when Jesus gave the Holy Spirit that Pentecost now has the meaning it has for us. So two in the spring, one in the fall. So if this reference in John 5, verse 1, uh, to a feast is um, the fall festival, all the activities of his up north ministry headquartered in Capernaum would have to be crammed into six months. Uh, that's why this is likely, it's a springtime festival, and most likely the Passover, which is the beginning of the second year. And then John 6, verse 4, uh, again, here it's a reference to the beginning of his third year of ministry. And then John 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover, this now is indicating the end of his public ministry and his death. Because John 19 is where Jesus says, it is finished, right? So that would seem to, to work and fit there. So looking now at verses 1 and 2 talks about Jesus crossed to the far shore and a great crowd of people followed him. I think you would say John isn't giving a whole lot of detail. You might say it's a bare bones report, but I think it'd be good for us to just kind of picture the scene of what this would be like, all right? You've got this great crowd of people following him as he crossed the shore. Just kind of, again, talk amongst yourselves at your tables for about a minute or so and try to describe what this scene must have been like or looked like. And then, as you're doing that, try to think about where you would fit in this scene on this day, all right? So first, try to describe what you think it looks like, and then where do you fit? So again, about a minute or so here. Now, that first part there, how, how do you picture this, this scene here, okay? Jesus crosses the shore and this great crowd of people follow him. In your mind, how do you envision that? I've never been there, um, so I couldn't say with certainty, like, can you see from one side to the other? Um, yep. Oh, you're getting ahead of me, huh? You're stealing my thunder. <laughs> Here, you want the microphone? No, yeah. So that, that's another point, right? Like, so how big is, I'm not exactly sure how big the Sea of Galilee is, uh, but it seems like they cross to the other side and the people somehow follow. 
Um, right? And now you've got the feeding of the 5,000, and that's just the men, right? So if you add women and children, you're pushing 15, 20, potentially, right? So massive amount of people, okay? So now they, they find Jesus, they catch up to him. How, do you just, how would you potentially picture this, this scene? You know, they're just standing back, kind of like, oh, hey, there's Jesus. Yep. Yeah. Like, maybe, like, think of a celebrity out in public. And like people recognize the celebrity and they're just kind of all like surrounding. Um, now it's a wide open space so you shouldn't have to worry about like people getting trampled and stuff like that, right? But just a massive amount of people most likely surrounding Jesus and his disciples were told um, he's up on a mountainside. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you call it chaotic or, or what, but like just... I don't know how, how we can necessarily like picture it. Like if there's anything in our modern day that we can compare it to, other than like a celebrity out in public and somebody just, or groups of people just like surrounding that celebrity. Yeah. And I think it talks about that a little bit in these verses too. Yeah. Yeah. Like it says there in verse two, like they followed him. Why? Because they saw the signs. He had performed by healing um, the sick. So did you have some people there who might have like truly believed he was Savior? Probably. I would imagine though the vast majority of them did not follow him because they believed that he was the Savior. He was a miracle man. They wanted to see, it was essentially he was like their form of entertainment, right? Like, they wanted to see these miracles, people getting healed, whatever it was. And so this was their potential form of entertainment. Wasn't this also like the year of opposition that there were the herders that were looking to see? That was starting at this point, yep. Yep. So now people kind of like sitting in the weeds, you know, watching, you know, taking notes. How can we catch him and all this kind of stuff, yep. Now... Where do you see yourself, see yourself in that story? Maybe this is more of just a self-reflection, not necessarily something you have to share. Um, but do you see yourself as one of the disciples? Uh, do you see yourself as someone who's just there for entertainment purposes? Do you see yourself as someone there who's just trying to find Jesus to heal uh, a family member or friend who is sick or has some kind of ailment, right? I think it's always easy for us to say, well, I'd be the disciple, right? I wonder if that is probably less likely than we think, right? So maybe just something to ponder, like where do I fit or where would I have fit uh, in this scenario among this crowd? What would I have been looking for from Jesus in this moment? And when you see kind of the conundrum that is going to appear here in these verses, right, where they're far from home, it's late, they don't have food, um, again, how would you see yourself fitting in that scenario? All right, moving on. Verses 5 to 9, the problem. Volunteer to read verses 5 to 9. Go ahead, thank you. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where are they to buy bread for these people? He asked his own disciples to get a sharper job of bread for the people of the city. Philip answered him, It would take more than six years for such half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Here is bread to buy a small boy. 
All right. So again, just some context here. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd, uh, Matthew and Mark record Jesus looked on the crowd with compassion, and then Mark adds, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, if you can just quickly look up these other examples of sheep shepherd imagery, um, and then describe kind of what that means for you. So maybe at each table, like one person can look up Psalm 23, another Matthew 7, another 1 Peter 5, and another John 10. All right, and just, again, look at those verses and describe what they mean for you, especially in regards to the sheep shepherd imagery that scripture uh, often portrays. So again, I'll give you a couple minutes here. I'm guessing Psalm 23 is pretty familiar to everybody, right? So as you ponder Psalm 23, what might be uh, your biggest takeaway? Or, or, or as you read that, what, what does it mean to you when Jesus you know, says, the Lord is my shepherd, or the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Especially as you think of that sheep-shepherd relationship. And you see that in the, the parable of the lost sheep, right? Leaves the 99 to go find the one that's missing. Any other takeaways from Psalm 23? What about Matthew 7 and 1 Peter 5? They're sort of, you know, speaking of the same thing, I think you would say, right? But what is... What does it mean for you when you read those words from those two sections of Scripture? What is the Good Shepherd doing for you? Yeah, and Matthew 7 is talking about from ferocious wolves, right? The sheep in wolves' clothing. So those who give the impression that they are godly, uh, that they are telling you the truth of God's word, but whether knowingly or unknowingly, they are potentially leading you astray. And then uh, 1 Peter 5. Peter 1.
And if you've ever seen like Discovery Channel shows on lions, right? They aren't just gonna stroll up with you know, you seeing them, they're gonna be right there ready to pounce uh, when you least uh, suspect it, right? They blend in with the, the grass or whatever it is, which I think is an interesting parallel to, you know, the Lord's warning to Cain. You know, he says, sin is crouching at your door, right? What does a lion do? It gets like as low as it possibly can, right? It's crouching until when the prey least uh, suspects it, it pounces. Like that's the picture of sin, right? Uh, if it's uncontrolled or unchecked, it's just crouching ready to pounce and take control and devour us. So our good shepherd protects us from that, that threat of sin and Satan. So you're saying So you're saying Jesus is saying we're dumb, right? Like I don't think it's a coincidence that we're compared to sheep. Like uh, uh, what it's uh, one of the good shepherd hymns confused and foolish oft I stray, right? Like there was this video like that's on Facebook that you see all the time like this guy pulls the sheep out of this crack or crevice. Maybe you've seen this, like the sheep is like stuck. The guy pulls the sheep out of the cracker crevice. It runs off, bam, right back into the cracker crevice. Like, it's just like, it's kind of how it is, right? Like we know the devil's tactics. We know like how he tries to tempt us. We probably, if we don't, we should know like where we are susceptible to temptation, right? And yet what happens? We're always falling into it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like you, you think about how like anybody, right, is like one click away from, and I think Pastor Christie mentioned that on Ash Wednesday, right? Like we're one click away from terrible content. And then you th look at like what something like pornography does to the brain. Like studies have shown it's like more addicting to the brain than crack cocaine. Again, you think about how that affects people, and right? So social media can be great, but it can also be just a, a devastating thing on the, on the human brain. So if you're telling this story about Jesus um, and, and looking at this crowd of people, um, how would you paint the picture so that the child is deeply touched? Like what is Jesus seeing and, and potentially feeling for these thousands of people that are there. Keeping in mind that they probably don't look at him as savior, they're probably looking at him as entertainment or a miracle worker, yet what does Jesus see them as? What does he feel for them? Thinking about kind of that context there and, uh, from Mark.
so he doesn't push them away because they have the wrong motivation. In fact, that you might say it makes him want to reach out to them more. And so maybe you could say like the compassion that he has, right? Like when I think of that word compassion, like you look at somebody, they're helpless, they can't do anything to help themselves, and you get that sick feeling in your stomach, right? You're just like, I just, you feel sorry for them. You want to be able to do something to help them, right? That is the feeling that Jesus has for these people, and it's the feeling that he has for them. And maybe, and this just popped in my head, like you think of, if you're talking to a child, you, you maybe can talk about to the child, do you have a classmate who's like left out? A classmate who's being bullied? Like, do you feel sorry for that person? Do you wish you could help them? Right? Like, that's how Jesus feels. Like, you want to help them. Like, there was a student who had just transferred um, from, to Wisco. I think he's a sophomore this year. And my wife found this student eating lunch alone in, like, a wrestling room. Because he's, like, I have no friends. Like, I, and, like, it's just like, oh, my goodness, are you serious? And so, it turns out, like, my son has him as a classmate in one class. Like, reach out to him, talk to him. I reach out to him. I'm like, I'm not, I got a couch in my room. Come sit on my couch during lunch, you know. And if you want to talk, fine. If you don't, that's cool, too. We got a place to hang out, right? Um, like, it's just like, it makes you sick to your stomach. Like, yeah, you're new, but. So maybe that's a way to maybe have a child understand like what Jesus feels for people because I'm guessing most children have been in that position where they haven't felt included. Um, they felt like left out, maybe have been bullied, whatever it is. What time does this usually end? Now? Oh, boy. Um, why don't we just quickly talk about like the, the, the people within this um, story. You've got Philip here who Jesus says, um, asked the question, where shall we buy bread? You know, think about Philip's maybe shock. Like, how in the world are we supposed to do that, right? Then you've got Andrew, um, because Philip is like, what's well, going to take all this money, like a year and a half wages, how are we supposed to do that? Uh, Andrew was like, well, uh, here's a boy. He's got, you know, five loaves of bread and two, two small fish. Maybe Andrew's doubting. He's maybe a little bit peeved at what's going on. And how about the boy, right? Maybe the boy's like, this is all I got. Like, this is supposed to be for me and my, my family, right? Like, you're going to take that and like, all these people, like, what? And so maybe the boy is just kind of like, wide-eyed, glossed over eyes, like, are you serious, right? And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus telling his disciples, you give them something to eat. Now, it says that in our verses why Jesus did all this, but again, it's good to remember, why did Jesus say that? You give them something to eat. What is he trying to get them to do? So there's, and the only answer is Jesus, right? You've seen me do all these miracles, right? And yet you're still trying to figure this out on your own? You don't think that I can do what, you know, I'm capable of doing? Like never once do they ask Jesus, like, what, Jesus, what should we do? Like, how can you help, right? They're all looking at, like, man, from their perspective. So he's wanting them to trust in him, to trust in his power. All right. Um, and then the solution, uh, maybe the biggest thing, right? Again, we're familiar with this. The, the loaves and the fish, they multiply. It feeds everybody. Uh, but then looking, um, my sheet's a little different because it you know, has notes on it. But verses 12 to 13. The significance, if any, of 12 baskets of leftovers. Chapter by 
And do you think the number 12 is a coincidence? Essentially, each disciple had a basket to take home, right? Like, I don't think that's a coincidence. And it, just another lesson that Jesus is able to do, you know, beyond what we can ask or imagine. Correct. Yeah. Now, does that mean, like, we're going to approach God and be like, I got, you know, more bills than money to pay. And so, God, you promised to provide, you know, well, of course not, right? But, you know, maybe you've been in that position, right? Like, the money's tight, and you're not sure how things are going to get paid, and yet the Lord is still providing, right? He's giving you what you need, not necessarily what you want. So, um, the biggest takeaway, right? Trust that the Lord can do what he can do. And his miracles have displayed it. And when you look at what we're talking about during Lent, right? Jesus going to the cross, Jesus rising from his grave. He could, he could rise from his grave. If he can come back from the dead, what can't he do? Right? So the problems we face in life, yeah, they can be challenging, they can be big. But God has told us and promised us he has overcome this world, right? Take heart. All right, that was a very quick uh, wrap-up on that. We had good discussion or something, all right? Um, do you, have you just said these hymn verses? Do you sing them like, all right? So, oh, go ahead. I was gonna ask if anybody had the note or, I'll go for it. Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is the one redeemer. All blessing, honor, thanks, and praise to Father, Son, and Spirit, the God who saved us by his grace. All glory to his merit. Triune God in heaven above, you have revealed your saving love. Your blessed name be hallowed. Why don't we just close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Thank you. For